Summary of the Hiding Place by Corrie Ten Boom Corrie Ten Boom starts her story by talking about a party she and her sister Betsy put on for their father's watch shop's 100th anniversary. Corrie helps Betsy make breakfast and clean up the house before she leaves. Soon, her sister Noli and her many children will come to visit. As the day goes on, more and more people come to the Ten Boom house, which is called the Beach. This includes Pickwick, a rich customer and one of father's closest friends. Corey keeps an eye out for her bigger brother Willem all afternoon. When he gets there, he takes with him a Jewish man who says he just left Germany because he was attacked in the street. Willem runs a home for old Jewish people, and lately he has been hiding a lot of people who are trying to get away from the Nazis. Father and Corey bring the man coffee and make him feel welcome, while the other guests think that Germany, a civilized country, will soon stop these hoodlums from doing bad things. Corey then takes a step back and talks about her childhood and teenage years. She and her older brothers Noli, Betsy, and Willem grew up in the beach. Father and Mama also live in the house, as do three of Mama's sisters, Tant Yance, who writes flaming Christian tracts, Tant B.P., who used to be a teacher, and Tant Anna, who does most of the housework because Mama gets sick a lot. Corey has to go to school for the first time one morning. She is scared and shy, so she chooses to just not go. During breakfast, however, father reads a long psalm about how God can make a hiding place for the faithful. Then, father himself walks Corey to school. On work trips to Amsterdam, Corey often goes with her father. He uses the accurate military clock in the city to set his own watch and all the clocks in the shop. He also goes to dealers, many of whom are Jews and sell him items. When business talks are over, the men pull out their Bibles and have lively conversations about what they say. Corey takes over running the house when she graduates from high school. Tant Jans, who has diabetes, is the person she takes care of the most. The disease makes Tant Jans, who is usually very strong, worried and on edge. Every week, Corey gives her Aunt Jans a difficult blood test. One week, the results are bad, and Corey knows that Jans only has a few weeks to live. The family tells the old woman the news kindly, but she doesn't seem to be upset or upset at all. Corey has faith that God always gives people the moral strength they need right when they need it the most. Corey meets Willem's best friend Carell at college when she is a youngster, and she falls in love with him. Corey thinks she's shy and plain, so the fact that Carell sees her makes her feel good. When Willem is finally ordained as a preacher and hired by his first church, his family and friends gather to hear his first lecture. During these weeks of joy, Corey and Carell get closer and talk about their future together, even though Carell hasn't yet asked Corey to marry him. Willem tells Corey one morning that Carell will never actually marry her because his parents want him to marry a rich woman and he is ready to do what they want. Corey doesn't want to accept what Willem says, but Carell doesn't write her much after she goes home. After a few months, he comes back to the beach with a woman he says is his fiancée. Corey runs upstairs crying after they leave. Father tries to calm her by telling her that she should ask God for help with her hurt and anger. Corey prays that she will be able to love Carell without thinking about herself, the way God does. Mama has a stroke soon after. Now, she has to stay in bed all the time and can't talk or write. Still, she keeps in touch with her family and friends by having Corey write them letters. In the meantime, Noli gets engaged to Flip, who is also a student at the school where she is learning to be a teacher. On the day of their wedding, Corey knows that she will probably never leave home or get married. She thinks about how she used to want to spend the rest of her life with Carell, but now she can think of him without the slightest trace of hurt. She knows that Jesus has helped her forgive Carell and pray for him in a serious way. Mama dies a few weeks after the wedding. Betsy has been keeping the books at the watch shop while Corey has been in charge of the house. Eventually, Though, the sisters switch places because Betsy is a better cleaner and Corey is more interested in the business. As she learned more about her father's job, she became the first Dutch woman to get a certificate as a watchmaker. By the time the shop turns 100, Corey has a full and busy life. 
She runs the shop, visits her brothers and their children, and takes care of the foster children that her father takes in. The Ten Booms have been listening to the radio and hearing about Germany's scary changes, but they don't understand how bad things are until Otto, a young watchmaking trainee and proud Nazi, comes to work at the shop. Otto often teases Christophels, an older worker at the store, and has even kicked and hit him in the street. Willem says that the Nazi belief that the old are useless to society leads to disrespect for them. Father tried to talk to the young man but couldn't get through to him. Soon after that, Germany goes to war with Holland and beats its army in just five days. The Ten Booms then have to get used to living in a city that has been taken over by Germany. There are German soldiers and tanks everywhere, a curfew has been set, ration cards are used to buy food, and the newspapers only print propaganda from Germany. Even scarier, Allied bombs are often heard at night and sometimes even break windows. But the worst thing about the rule is that Jews are being persecuted more and more. Many shops stop serving Jews, and in the end, they are forced to wear yellow stars on their clothes. Some people are taken from their homes without being told. Corey is shocked to see that many Dutch people don't care about this wrong or even take part in it by joining the Dutch Nazi Party NSB, and taking over the shops and homes of Jews who were sent away. One afternoon, German soldiers broke into a Jewish store across from the beach and stole everything. Corey and Betsy bring the owner into their house quickly. After getting in touch with his wife, they make plans to get him to Willem's house. Willem is already giving safety to some Dutch Jews because he has ties to the Jewish community. Willem's son Kik picks them up at night and tells Corey that she is now part of the underground. Corey knows that there is a rebel group in Holland, but she always thinks that people in these groups do bad things like steal and lie. She has trouble seeing herself as a part of it. As time goes on, the Ten Booms do what they can to help their Jewish neighbors. Corey picks up and brings watches for Jewish customers so they don't have to go out on the streets. A rabbi keeps his books in the beach. Father makes friends with Harry de Vries, a guy he and Corey have seen on their evening walks for years. Jews whose homes or businesses have been searched by the Gestapo start staying at the beach because they are afraid of being sent away. Corey asks Willem to find better and more stable places for these people in the country. However, it's hard to place people who are on the run without ration cards, which Jews don't get. Corey asks a family friend who works in the food office, Fred Kornstra, for help. Together, they come up with a plan to make fake food cards. This lets Corey take in more people and give them things to take with them when they move on. Corey is taken by Kick to a secret underground meeting which is led by Pickwick, an old family friend. Pickwick sends an engineer to the beach to build a secret room where people can hide if the Gestapo comes to search the house. Every day, Corey faces new problems, but with help, she always finds a way to solve them. Corey meets a man through Pickwick who sets up a secret phone in her house. She also finds more places to get fake ration cards, and a police officer named Rolf turns out to be kind and gives her information about where the Gestapo is going. But not everything works out. Once, Corey was trying to find a place for a mother and her young child to hide. She asked a preacher she knew from her family to take them in, but he was too afraid and said no. Corey has to put them in a house that isn't as safe, and they are later sent away. Some people also start to live there full-time. Meyer is a man that the Ten Booms take in because he looks so stereotypically Jewish that other safe houses don't want to take him in. Meyer is very religious and knows a lot about the Bible. He becomes good friends with Father. Hank and Lendert, two young guys, and some Jewish women are also taken in by Corey. They have regular drills where the fugitives try to get their things together and hide in the secret room as quickly as possible. Corey's brothers wake her up at night and ask her to get her ready for a possible interrogation. Corey has a hard time with this part because she isn't used to lying. One night, a stranger comes to the beach and asks Corey what he can do to help his wife, who is in jail because she helped Jews. Corey tells him what to do and gives him some money because she has the flu and is too sick and tired to think about it much. 
the Gestapo broke into the house that night. They question Corey and the rest of her family for hours, but they won't say that Jews are hiding there, so the Germans don't find the secret room. In the end, they arrest Peter, Willem, Noli, and her husband, along with the rest of the family. The family is taken to a Hague jail. Corey is taken away from her sisters and put in a cell with a lot of other women. She is sick, scared, and bored in the cell. Due to her illness, she is finally put in a cell by herself, where she stays until her health gets better. She stays in the cell for four months. At some point, Noli sends her a letter telling her that father died in a hospital ten days after they were arrested. Lieutenant Roms, a German army officer, talks to Corey several times about what she knows. Instead of giving him information, Corey talks to the cop about the Bible, which seems to touch him. He tells her that he hates his job at the jail and wants nothing more than to go home to his family. At the same time, he feels like he can't do anything to change the way things are in the jail or his job. After a while, Lt. Roms lets the whole family meet up at the jail, saying that they need to read father's will. Corey hasn't seen her family in months. Everyone else has been set free except for her and Betsy. Willem tells her that all of the Jews who were hidden in the beach were able to get away, even though the police were watching the house for a few days. After a while, the women in the jail are taken to a concentration camp in Holland called Voot. Even though they are living in a sad place, Corey is happy to be back with Betsy. Corey is sent to a workshop to put together German radios. The mood is friendly because the prisoner foreman tells everyone to take their time. Corey talks to Betsy, whose job it is to make socks, in the evenings. Betsy finds out that the spy who told on them, Jan Vogel, is a well-known accomplice in all of Holland. Betsy says that he must be suffering dreadfully and tells Corey to pray for him. Corey feels angry every time she thinks about him. As reports spread that Germany is losing the war and that the Allies are getting closer to Holland, the women prisoners are sent to the German concentration camp Ravensbrück. They have to sleep outside in the rain for a few days while they wait to be processed, which gives Betsy a cough that won't go away. Still, Corey is able to sneak a sweater for her sister and a small Bible past the guards. She is shocked to find that the barracks are full of fleas and that each bed is shared by several women. Still, Betsy reminds her that the Bible says to thank God in all circumstances. There is a lot of complaining and fighting in the barracks, but Betsy improves the situation and brings people together by praying and eventually leading prayer services for women of all Christian denominations. In the end, they figure out that the guards haven't found out about their wrongdoing because they are too afraid of fleas to check the barracks. Even the fleas are part of God's plan, Corey sees. Betsy's illness gets worse, and she has to stay in the hospital for days at a time. When she's not there, she makes socks with other women who are too weak to work outside. Corey eventually joins this group, and the women spend the day praying and thinking about what they will do when the war is over. Betsy says that she and Corey will open a house for people who have been in a prison camp and need to get back on their feet. But one day, Betsy is sick and can't get out of bed for roll call. She is taken to the hospital, but by the time Corey gets out of work to go see her, she has already died. Corey is freed one day for what seems like no reason. She and a few other prisoners are taken to a train stop and left there on their own. Once she gets to Holland, she limps to a hospital, where kind nurses take care of her for a few days and then help her get to Willem's house. Her brothers are so happy to see her, but they are very sad to hear that Betsy died. Corey is shocked to hear that Kick has been sent to Germany and no one knows where he is. After a while, Corey goes back to the beach, which she now lives in by herself. The house feels empty and is haunted by memories of the people who used to live there. She turns the house into a school and meeting place for mentally disabled children who can't go outside because Nazi forces are always bothering them. This gives her something to do and gives her a sense of purpose. Even before the war is over, Corey meets a rich widow who decides to let her turn her country house in Ravensbrück into the healing center that Betsy had always wanted. Almost as soon as the Allies take over Holland, 
Lots of people from concentration camps or hiding places in Holland start showing up at the house. At the home, they learn how to do everyday things again and try to get over their anger toward both the Germans and the Dutch who helped them. Even though she knows it's hard, Cory always tells her people to forgive those who have hurt them. Over time, Cory becomes well known as a public speaker who tells large groups about what Betsy taught her about how important it is to forget. Even worse, she starts to speak German. During one church meeting, she sees an ex-SS guard from Ravensbrück. When the man comes up to her to shake her hand, she thinks about all the pain Betsy went through there and can't forgive him. Still, as she prays for help, she feels her arm get warm and seem to lift itself. She knows that God has helped her deal with her own need to forgive. In the end, Cory works with a German rescue group that was moved by her work to turn a former concentration camp into a shelter for homeless Germans. These were the same people who had locked her up. About the author. Cory ten Boom was born at the turn of the 20th century into a big, religious Dutch family, as her biography explains in detail. During World War II, Ten Boom had Jewish refugees and was sent to the concentration camps of Voot and Ravensbrück. When he got out, he went back to Holland and opened recovery centers for both Holocaust survivors and former Dutch Nazi accomplices. To get money for these projects, Ten Boom started telling church groups about her life. She became famous quickly and toured the world as an inspiring speaker for evangelicals. She spoke with famous preachers like Billy Graham. She became not only a religious thought but also a critic of society who spoke out against things like the Vietnam War. Corey wrote many books about her life and how it related to Christianity. The Hiding Place is the most well-known of these books. Ten Boom was recognized as one of the righteous among the nations, a title given by Israel to non-Jews who put themselves in danger to save Jewish lives during the war during the last years of her life, Ten Boom relocated to California, and on the 91st birthday of her life, she died. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.